Now we're all going to have to offer free online courses to anybody who cares. Um, what else is going on? And no doubt many of these themes you've heard about, uh, widening participation, uh, this is from a few weeks ago. So we've got lots of students coming to university now who traditionally may not have been coming to university. Uh, and that's going to cause various um, challenges in various different places, some more than others. Uh, workloads and cuts, one that's very dear to most of us here. Uh, you know, La Trobe and Sydney being the fairly obvious examples where there's been a lot of unrest about some of these types of issues. This is all ringing bells, yes? No? No? Uh, academic standards, of course, is one other thing that's been talked about a lot at the moment in the wake of TEXA. Uh, Again, you know, this is only a couple of days old. Stephen Swartz, who's not shy of, uh, the, I think he's former BC at Macquarie now, I think he's, uh, he's finished up. Uh, never been shy on having your say about anything. Uh, he's come out a few days ago and said that um, the, the standards that we're setting are uh, looking fairly dubious at this point. Mm -hmm. So there's a, a fair bit of discussion around that. And again, no doubt many of you have heard some of this stuff. Uh, of course, there's this other side of it, which is that, well, okay, we're gonna let a whole lot of people who wouldn't have traditionally come to university in, do we need to dumb down the curriculum in order to uh, make that happen and get them through in another debate that uh, we can talk about during the day. Um, academic development, there are some interesting things happening in this space as well uh, for the academic developers in the room, and we know that there are quite a large number in our membership. Uh, this was something interesting that came out a couple of weeks ago. Uh, ANU have decided to get rid of their graduate certificate teaching, which I don't know about the rest of you, but certainly we've had a few conversations at our place about this and what this might mean in the future. Uh, so it's another interesting topic that we can think about during the day. Uh, this one's always a hot topic, uh, never seems to go away, uh, but again, over the last couple of weeks there's been a talk about uh, a freeze of research funding and uh, no doubt that's making a few people upstairs a bit nervous. Uh, and of course, student engagement, uh, one that's generally top of the pops a lot of the time as well. Um, look, this is kind of an interesting story. Uh, this is the University of New South Wales where apparently they don't like all their students getting drunk all the time. Mm -hmm. no, not sure what they're going to be able to do to I stop that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it is making, making news at the University of New South Wales at the moment. So. Anything else? Any other hot topics that any of you uh, can think of at the moment that might be coming up that I haven't mentioned? Come on, you've all had your espresso. <laughs> what do I miss? I would say something like um, identity and roles. Are they changing, blurring? You know? Good point. People, people and players are coming into the, the arena. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Good one. Anything else? Yeah. Well, I'm not sure about other universities, but restructuring seems to be the activity of the flavour of the month. Changing organisation. Yep. Restructuring. Sound familiar? Yep. Retention. Bums on seats. Bums on seats, yes. Or bums online, if you like. <laughs> <laughs> you can take that in more than one way. seem to get these these messages that say, oh yeah, you know, just put everything online, it'll be cheaper, it'll take less time, but I haven't seen any evidence that it's either cheaper or takes less time at this point. I don't know if anybody else has. You know, putting things online doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to automatically save money. That's good. Quality of the student experience? Absolutely. Yes. Yep. It's an open market now, isn't it? So absolutely. And all issues that we will come across during the day, no doubt. Um, Pro profits over pedagogy. <laughs> yes. It seems to be a pretty common one. Yep. Good one. Good one. You suggest to universities and businesses. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not start that. Yet, so. uh, we'll do that this afternoon when we've got a beer in our hands. Um, <laughs> one thing for those who are just sort of new to this, and for those who um, have been doing research in higher ed for a while, might be familiar with this particular resource. Um, this is now from Tide's book, which uh, this is the second edition that came out fairly recently. 
Um, I found, having come from a discipline myself, that this was really useful to get my head around how uh, the research in higher ed works. But there was one interesting thing that I wanted to sort of take out of that that uh, is something that might help guide some of our thinking and talking during the day. Um, and that was, there was one particular bit where uh, he talked about what's actually been published in the higher ed journals over a, few, over a, a period of time. Now he looked at a sample of uh, 567 articles and these were in the top higher education journals, the ones that most of you are no doubt familiar with. Um, the breakdown I thought was really interesting. So there were quite a few articles on course design, uh, articles on the student experience, not surprising, uh, articles on academic work, which is an issue that's already come up this morning and talked about, uh, system policy, that's the stuff that you read if you want to fall asleep. Uh, <laughs> And the stuff that's actually about teaching and or learning only made up a small proportion. Now I know that that doesn't add up to 567 before you um, say to me that I can't add up. I do realise that, I've left a few of them out. My point was that it was interesting that, you know, for a lot of us we think about this as being what our core business is, but yet out of 567 articles there were really only a handful of them that actually talk about learning and teaching, which I thought to me was quite interesting. Um, take what you want out of that. Okay. What I'd like to do now, um, that we've sort of hopefully given you some ideas of some things that you might want to think about today, is I'd like to invite Glyn Thomas up. Glyn's going to talk a little bit about what's happening uh, for Hertz at a national level. Glyn's on the executive, so we've just asked him to give us some sort of flavour about uh, uh, what's happening nationally. So, Glyn. Uh, I won't be as topical as uh, Jason has been, but to just it really just sort of an, an update on the sort of things that have been going on. Uh, uh, at the 2012 conference in Hobart, three new guides were released. You'd be aware that Hertz that Herzl publishes a, a range of guides, and the titles of those guides were Effective Feedback for Student Learning by Iris Barty, Using Stories in Teaching by one of the TATL groups. TATL stands for Teaching and Talking About Learning, so that's been a theme um, of within the Hertz of what some time, and they've published a guide. And then uh, Maureen Bell has republished a guide on peer observation partnerships in higher education. I think there's some information outside about guides if you wanted to find out more about them, or you can download information about them and even order them online through the Hertz website. Um, the fellowship scheme, which is part of the Hertz Association, is currently under review, and you might have seen an email recently for your opinions on that. And I encourage you to respond to that survey, it's not too late. Even if you've never thought of engaging in the fellowship scheme, that would be an interesting perspective that um, we, we'd be interested in, I guess, hearing more about why it's not engaging you, or if you have thought about it, what stops you from perhaps um, following through. Uh, that re review of the fellowship scheme is, is to be completed by November and, and should help us to improve that scheme. Um, as far as the Herd Journal, um, there's plans to increase the number of articles that are published in each issue. Uh, in for the balance of two, so that officially starts next year. But at uh, at the conference, the executive decided to start that process earlier. And it's interesting, just to include six more articles, which is two more in each of the issues that are still to be published in 2012, cost an extra four thousand four hundred dollars just to add those papers in. And you might think, well, what's the point? Well, at the moment, there's about two-year backlog between your paper being accepted and being published in Herd, which is, I think for most authors, there's a bit of a disincentive to publish to Herd. There's a rejection rate of about 45%, and um, we quite proudly talk about rejection rates. I, I think that's an interesting way of being proud about something, but um, I think it would be better probably to talk about quality. But um, anyway, there is plan to try to shorten the Q&E, some of that backlog. Some of those problems to do with backlogs in the journal stem from having lots and lots of special issues which put the regular submissions sort of back in the in the chain a bit. So there's a plan to move to just one special issue a year to try to prevent that from happening. But the good news is that the Hersa Journal is now available in now 9,000 libraries around the world through the Tom and Francis um, online availability system. And the review process has been streamlined from um, three reviews down to two to try to make that uh, less onerous process both for her and I guess also for all of us. Uh, submissions are still very good for the journal. There was 168 new submissions in the first six months of this year. Um, 
a couple of other bits and pieces. The profit from the Tassie conference was quite small, only about $2,000, which was drastically uh, lower than the Queensland conference, and that's probably as much to do with geography as anything else, I suspect. Be careful about that, uh, rewarding our group of colleagues for the great job they did with uh, the 2011 conference. Um, Interesting thing, if you ever think of organising a conference, the credit card fee bill was about $8,000 just from people using their credit cards to pay for the conference. So it's become, interestingly, one of the things that you have to factor into budgeting for something like, like a conference is what the credit card companies take for people paying by the credit card, which now happens more than it's probably ever done before. Just a little tidbit there. Um, Auckland is the, is the venue for the Perth's conference in 2013. Um, the, the early bird rate, they managed to keep up under $1,000, so it's $990. Um, Hong Kong is the venue for 2014, so you can plan your shopping sprees, if you can hold on to them. And there's currently calls out for the 2015, 2016, 2016 conferences. And uh, at the moment, we're trying to, uh, UQ, in, in conjunction with some of our other Partner universities here in in Brisbane are trying to organise maybe having an ISOFL conference around the same time as the Herzog conference in 2015, and just waiting to hear back from ISOFL as to whether that's possible because normally their conferences are held in October, November. So that's about it for me. I can answer any questions, but um, and I'm around. Most of the done. Um, that's a good question. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, that's something I can certainly raise with Jennifer. The, 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 and I'm just wondering for the conference whether BK should be in the Yeah, I don't know. But a good, good question. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Jess. Thanks. Okay. Um, between now and morning tea, what we wanted to do is to give you a chance to do the one thing that um, more people said was essential uh, than any other. So what I'm gonna ask you to do, um, and it's kind of like having a chat, but it's a structured chat so that there is some sort of outcome hopefully at the end of it. Um, if you are sitting at a table with a whole bunch of people that you already know, then you might wanna think about moving tables. But what we would like you to do is we would like you to uh, learn enough about the other person, one other person at that table. Uh, groups of three, this will tend to work best in, but to split up into two or four, that's fine. You will introduce one other person and you'll tell us about who they are, um, what's their academic tribe, so discipline type context, um, what scholarly areas are they interested in, and what do they hope to get out of the day. Now I know this might sound like a fairly low level uh, ice breaking exercise, but we're hoping that this will be the start of uh, some networking that will hopefully lead to some collaborations by the end of the day. So if you could, uh, kick off on that now and what we'll do is I'll give you a little while to get to know the other person that you're going to be introducing and then we'll bring everybody back together and you will introduce uh, that person to the rest of the group at the end of it. Any questions? All good? Go for it.